So Greg, we are here at Open Source Leadership Summit. Yes. What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> it's not about Linux, it's about open source. It is, yeah, but it's Linux. So Linux is underneath all this stuff. It, it, to be fair, that is true. This is not, there's one other developer here. We're like, hey, a developer. <laughs> um, but he's representing his company. Um, I'm here to answer questions and talk about, so I actually had to talk about licensing for the kernel and SPDX and, and stuff like that. Um, and then there's also a Linux Foundation board meeting later to, this week. So when you talk about licensing, what do you mean? So the kernel is GPL version 2, right? Mm -hmm. But the kernel source tree itself has like 10, 12 different licenses in it mm -hmm. for different things based on what it is. Um, we recently just, um, SPDX is a way to identify license in one single string, right. one single line. And ideally, you'd be able to just grep the whole, cert, the whole kernel tree and you know the license for everything. Um, but turns out it's more complex. There's um, six different variants of GPL v2 text we found out. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So in doing this research, like, which GPL v2 do you care about? Um, we have boilerplate text that is wrong in places. There's 700 different ways we say GPL v2 in, in the files of 25,000 files, right? <laughs> 700 different ways. So part of the work is to go through and clean up all that. Um, recently, um, back in November or December, uh, it turned out 11,000 of our files had no licensed text at all. Ooh, so okay. I did one commit to the kernel tree that I touched 11,000 files and added the proper... So you have so much power? Well, we, <laughs> <laughs> we talked about this in the kernel summit. We all got together and um, we're going to use the SPDX. Here's how we write it. And then we're, after that, we're going through and cleaning up all this weird boilerplate and using just the simple, here's the line, here's what the text is. Because some files are dual licensed. Mm -hmm. You can be um, GPL version 2 only or GPL version 2 or anything else after that. So we just get the right list. And we're cleaning it all up. Um, so we've got to talk about licensing. Okay, and I think you're working with Kate. I, yeah, I mean, Kate did yeah, talk. Yeah, I so it's Kate and me and Philippe. Yes, yeah, there's two people. Yeah. Because I did a story about SPD a few, day, yeah. few months ago. It was a great deal. Because people, when they think about open source, they think, oh, it's open source, we don't have to worry about licensing or compliance, you know? But that's not the case. Right, it's, it's really tricky. And uh, how do you comply, even with the Apache and the BSD licenses, require attribution? Exactly. How do you do that? So a really cool thing is um, the FSFE came out with a tool called Reuse, mm -hmm. and there, um, you can run it on your repo, and it sucks all the license out of it and makes a manifest that accurately describes exactly what the source code is mm -hmm. for your thing. And so people that build products based on open source can use that tool to properly know how to handle what they're supposed to be doing, what their rules are, what they have to handle. I think the FSFA is totally different from FSF from US, right? Correct. They're totally yeah, two, independent. two different organizations. Yeah, yeah because I, I met Matthias and, yeah. you know, and George Grieve, who is also the open other founder, and he's a very good friend, so we talked about you know, the difference between two organizations. Yeah. One is like Greenpeace, <laughs> they beat everybody up, and the other one is like more. <laughs> I don't know, I've known, the, I've known both, both, by, both parties very well. Yeah. I am a member of FSFE, Yeah, I, I do support what they do, so um, I work closely with them, and now I live in Europe, so it's easier. It's to do. even easier. And they're doing some incredible work there. They are, so like even just uh, tools that we use, but then the whole um, public Public um, funds, public source. Yes, that? yes, yes. I'm saying that word wrong. Yeah, yeah but yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, yeah. that's but a great, great um, initiative. And I know, like the government of France, mm -hmm. um, has the um, rule that they have to release everything now. Right. That they uh, that that they produce um, all their data has to be even open, mm -hmm. which is great. So the governments are changing and, and producing open source code in huge amounts now. And now, since you have moved to France, and a lot of you know kernel developers, you know Leonard and a lot of people, they are based in Europe. So how does it change your working? I mean, you work on mailing lists, but yeah, it doesn't. Uh, like I can live anywhere in the world; it doesn't matter. Um, in fact, there's a, but there's three of us on the kernel security team that have to live in Paris, <laughs> so we get together for lunch. You like, have so. to live in Paris? No, that we happen to all <laughs> oh, live in Paris. To, okay. So no, three of us out of the twelve kernel security people on the team, we all live in Paris, so we get together for lunch once a month. Which oh, is kind of funny. That, <laughs> it's just really random. But um, so, so, do you talk about kernel stuff only, or you really enjoy French fries? <laughs> <laughs> we have good food, um, <laughs> um, good meat, and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, but no, we but no, we talk kernel security stuff. We are all developers. But I think you're a vegetarian, right? I was until I moved to France. Uh, yeah, because once you yeah I, I know. yeah when you can't read the language, you just have to accept sometimes what they give you. When we lived in Fr Germ uh, Belgium, because they speak French there, we were never able to order pizza over phone. Yeah. It was never there, so. <laughs> so how, how is the experience living there versus here? Because I, I feel that there's much more awareness about open source and Linux, you know, all across the board. Um, it is, I mean, so France specifically has um, the university I work with and INRIA. INRIA is the French government agency that um, 
computer science, and they've been a huge supporter of open source for the year. They supported initial GCC development. And there's a huge uh, community of open source developers in there. Um, they have the language um, OCaml, which is all mm -hmm. open source, and that's a very French-driven language, uh, programming language that the um, research communities use as well as the finance communities. Mm -hmm. So that's all open source. Um, the universities teach on Linux, and there's a really, really, one reason I went to Paris was there's a really good group of researchers there that do systems development, um, research on operating systems for that are applicable, so it's research that people can use. Mm -hmm. So um, Julia Lowell, who made Coconel, the, the tool that has fixed more kernel bugs than anybody else, um, and her team um, have done a really good stuff, and they have graduate students, and they do other research. And, stuff like and since you're there in France, are you also working with like any government organization or something like that to help them? Um, I have contacts within different agencies in the French government mm -hmm. that I have that do use Linux, and I meet with them just because I've met these people and provide and um, provide um, advice for them. Um, one of them created a tool. A template for the um, office of the CIO of the French government mm -hmm. that allows um, people to adopt um, an open source um, methodology for their company, mm -hmm. and um, so they we all created it with uh, advice of uh, lots of different governments. Um, it was done in an open source way. The To Do Group, a whole bunch of different people came together and wrote this template up. And you can take this template and um, it's been translated to French, of course, and use that as a way to have um, to control how open source is used. It like gives defaults of, hey, this is the licenses you should use, and here's how you deal with the community, and here's the stuff. It's a great template, and it's all open. Uh, it's part of the To Do Group re website now, um, so I was involved in that. Okay. So that was really good. Okay, now let's just switch gears from Paris and France to yeah. real. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. I live there, so I do know <laughs> what it feels like. Um, uh, for the last one or two years, uh, one of the things that has plagued Linux world has been security. You know, not just Linux world, but you know, we saw the whole Intel. Before we go there, uh, when we think about open source, we always think, oh, it's secure. The code is open. It would be between hard bleed, and a lot of things happen. Uh, so, what effort is the Linux kernel community make? As Linux says, you know, the software is part, uh, bug is part of software development process. So, so what steps are you taking to ensure that okay, bugs will be there, but to detect them early or to to uh, uh, you know kind of mitigate them before they actually are released and they find the way in the system? Number one. So, yeah, so there's yeah, there's two things. There's one is a bug is a bug. Mm. We don't know if a bug is a security bug or not. Mm -hmm. There's a famous bug that I fixed, and then three years later, Red Hat realized it was a security hole. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but the other thing is, um, uh, the security, the kernel community realizes that we need to have mitigations. Exactly. So um, hardening, mm -hmm. we need to have hardening. So there's been a huge effort by Case Cook and others to take um, hardening features that have been traditionally outside the kernel and get them merged or adapt them for the kernel, um, so that when the bugs happen, because they will always happen, um, you can't do anything about it, or mm -hmm. it didn't hurt you. Yeah. So, like, we have a simple one of um, when you increment a number too much, it would overflow. So yes. the reference count, and you could leak memory that way. And now we, it won't. It'll stop. <laughs> so I mean, there are things like that. We'll, we'll do things like that. Um, some stuff with protected memory and some other stuff. So that when the bug happens, the traditional old one was if you referenced zero as a pointer. You want, and traditionally, that used to be a security hole because mm -hmm. you could access that. Um, many years ago, we made it so we changed the way the kernel was laid out so that if that happened, it was just a bug. And you couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't hurt you. Um, so we're in, in every kernel that release gets released. Case Cook does a little summary of all the new hardening features that are there. That being said, you have to enable them to take advantage of them. Exactly. <laughs> so I've seen, I've gone through and audited a whole bunch of Android phones recently, and um, some recent security bugs that we had, um, like that would, um, if you had enabled the hardening features, mm -hmm. wouldn't have even tripped it. There's a Bluetooth bug recently. That um, it was a buffer overflow. Um, if you enabled the um, buffer overflow checking and stuff that we have in the kernel, um, it wasn't mitigated. So all your Pixel phones were fine. They didn't even care about the bug. Mm -hmm. But other phones that just didn't turn that configuration on were vulnerable. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's part of getting into the kernel and then and letting people know that they need to enable this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that is the second part of the point was that even if you fix things, as you gave example of Red Hat, and we have seen, and we also talked about earlier also, that uh, the, the system should be designed in a way that they, whatever changes or patches you're making, they should be actually, you know, up 
applied. Yes, but yeah, they should be applied and they should be used. Um, so we release the stable kernels mm -hmm. every week. I do a new stable kernel. Um, Google announced that like one of the stable kernels 4.4, they wanted to support for six years. Mm -hmm. um, and they're doing that in a way because they want device manufacturers to take advantage of this. Um, and then what I did is I went out and bought all the top of the line phones that are based on the 4.4 kernel and see which one's actually updated. Mm -hmm. And so far only one company has actually updated their kernel. Um, so the fact that we're releasing these kernels that are stable and update and um, have these new have these bug fixes as well as so there's the carrot and the stick. They have security fixes and tons of bug fixes, but they have some improvements. Like we sped up um, out of memory handling, we sped up a whole bunch of stuff. So you get you get benefits by taking these updates as well. Um, these manufacturers haven't taken them yet. They're not updated, and so I'm working through the whole supply chain of trying to solve that problem because it's a tough problem. There's many different groups involved: the SOC, the manufacturer, the carrier. Um, but the point is, it has to push that kernel that we create out to people so they mm -hmm. actually use it. But for the long term, you know, you can't keep, you know, keeping up because there are so many bottlenecks, as you gave example, you know, that you know. But why not? So today, your Android phone gets a security update a month. Mm -hmm. That'd be wonderful. Just update the kernel then. Yeah, but uh, who's going to do that? Google? No, so, yeah, well, Google today already releases security updates once a month. What about Samsung? They, but then you got to push that. I mean, the, the, so there is a yeah, large exactly. ecosystem, right? Yeah, so if you control the whole supply chain, it'd be wonderful. Um, but the way our ecosystem works, it doesn't If we just keep the these, you know, consumer space, we talk about the server space, mm -hmm. where we have you know, uh, Core OS, which uh, Red Hat has acquired. Mm -hmm. They came up with the model where, you know, it's you know, at atomic patches in the updates, they're installed up. Yeah, that came from Android, actually. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. The method know. came from yeah. Android. But yes, yeah, the, um, constantly keeping up to date and update. And if you look, even the enterprise dishes, Red Hat and SUSE, they're, even their big enterprise kernels do get up to date mm -hmm. all the time, too. Yeah. But you just have to update them. Update them. Yeah. But with modern systems of you have lots of containers and pods and virtualizations, that makes it even easier because you don't, you're not relying on your 99, your nines of stability for your one machine. Right. You can reboot this one, reboot this one, and update it at the same right. time. And with us, actually made things better, easier to be secure than it used to be. Yeah, but now good. IoT devices are there, Google Home and Alexa. Yeah. I heard a story on Verge that the, the author complained that, you know, I was listening to a music and there was an update and Alexa stopped my music and updated. I think it's a good thing yeah. that they stopped the music and updated because if it is a security patch, I wouldn't mind, you know, my music getting stopped if the company is, you know, proactive and, you know. Running. Yeah, or do it at night or, I mean. Except yeah, if you're dr running a thing. Tesla, you don't, you know, you suddenly right. don't <laughs> take over the system. But, right, uh, so like my TV, you know, it tells me, okay, I'll, I want to do this update. Is it okay to do it now or do you want me to do it later tonight? Right. It doesn't. So. It does, yeah. Uh, and what about the heart bleed and you know spectra? How, how meltdown, uh, mel meltdown and spectra? Yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Is it. it's long day. Yeah, seven <laughs> interviews. So, um, yeah, meltdown and spectra. Um, first off, in the severity level of things, um, very minor. Okay. All you can do really with heart bleed, uh, no, yeah, see, I did. <laughs> meltdown and spectra is you can read data that you shouldn't be able to read from somebody mm -hmm. else. You can't modify it, you can't change what they're doing, but you can get some information out of it. Um, that being said, um, there's a really, Intel approached um, this problem that Google reported um, in a very different way. They approached it as a hardware bug mm -hmm. because originally it was reported that, hey, the CPU is doing something really weird. So their hardware division was in charge of managing this. And then the software side got involved very late in the process. And then the way that Intel managed it, um, as everybody knows, was not really that good. To be fair, though, Linux, by the time the leak happened a week early, um, Linux was fixed for um, Meltdown. Mm -hmm. We fixed it on time. Um, Spectra was another issue. We got access to Spectra. Uh, the fixes and know about it about, we thought one week before we had to release, actually it was one day because it got earlier. Um, now the latest kernel versions are all fixed, mm -hmm. so we fixed it all. Um, the way Intel handled it um, was hard for the other open source operating systems. The BSDs were not notified. Right. Um, the Open Solaris was not notified, and that's that. So, and Intel is, ta I've talked to them, I just had a phone call with them again today. They're reworking on how they approach security bugs and how they um, work with the community because they know they did it wrong. Um, so that so we do have a well in place um, process to do this. Security at kernel.org. You email us. Here's the bug, and we fix it. And we do this all the time. We do the I fixed. We fixed security bugs that you could arguably say was more important like two weeks ago than what Meltdown Spectre was. Nobody noticed. We pushed it out. Everybody got it. Everything was happy. 
still no web. There's not there's not advertising behind it, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> that to be fair, Meltdown and Spectre was a very unique thing that um, we fix bugs in hardware all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what a kernel does. Yeah, that's it, yeah. um, but this just happened to be a piece of hardware that everybody has. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also it does. I mean, the mod the 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 bug was that it it was an assumption that we thought the CPU worked this way, and it turns mm -hmm. out it wasn't. So it, it kind of like the formal methods people are really interested because all of a sudden their model of what a CPU can and cannot do is wrong. So all their, their formal proofs for how things are supposed to work flew out the window because it turns out there's a side channel because they predict in the future and you can actually detect the prediction. Um, so the, the, it was kind of a little side note that those people who formally prove programs are having to revisit everything. <laughs> so, so, I mean, does Intel need a new architecture, or that's totally... No, I mean, so Meltdown was, a, yeah, Meltdown's fixed, that's a mm -hmm. easy. Uh, Spectre, um, it's just the way CPUs were designed, that they, um, in order to go faster, you have to look for, farther ahead in the future, and so, in some rare cases, when you can, when you can modify what you're testing, so it's very simple, if this happens, then do that, so that do that was actually executed before the if happened. Okay. And so if you can control what that if is testing, um, you can sometimes see what that that is. Okay. Uh, pointing. So it's, you're looking, you can, and then if you're looking from the side, you can see that. So in the kernel, or um, what you're doing is you're crossing a security boundary. So me as a process, I can see what another process is doing. Or me as a virtual machine, I can see what another virtual machine is doing, if I can control data out there. And you can, so there's been proof of executions of how to do this. Or your browser. Your browser, like you run insecure, you run on, you run JavaScript and you mm -hmm. don't want another tab to see what that tab is. Oh, yeah. So the browsers are fixed for it now. The kernel's fixed for almost all the big Spectra issues. Um, it's going to be a long tail of minor things mm -hmm. where um, we just, we're sweeping the whole kernel of all, um, are, is this data that comes from the user or that the user can modify and do we need to protect from that? And we have tools that are testing for this thing in static analysis, but the false positive rate is like hugely high, so we have to dig through it by hand. But all the big issues for x86 and ARM are fixed. Other CPUs are more interesting. So, so when you talk about all this security, you know, you, you, I mean, you are actually becoming like a security expert. <laughs> uh, are there like, I mean, do you have some big maintainers there? So are you, are there like some maintainers dedicated to doing this? Or it's like, whether it's Linux or you or Andrew or whoever, you know, key, they, everybody's doing everything. So we have a security team, mm -hmm. right? Our, our security, so like the kernel security team is just a bunch of people who know the core of the kernel. When we get a report, we then drag in the domain ownership. So mm -hmm. say there's a bug in the sound subsystem. Mm -hmm. We say, hey, Takashi, there's a bug over here. So we grab him and pull it in, and then we get the local ownership. Sometimes on the security team, we had some areas of the kernel that were always grabbing the same people. So mm -hmm. we made them just part of the security team exactly. to make it save that extra hop. <laughs> um, so it turns out a lot of the core kernel people are on the security team. We just fix the bug and everything's fine. Um, but I mean, all parts of the kernel have to be aware of these security issues because we are a trusted environment exactly. and you have to protect it. So these are just, um, we have things in place that once we fix things, we can put them in our static analysis rules and that way we never get it reintroduced. Mm -hmm. So we do things like that. Um, but, and then on the other side is like Case Cook and his work um, are adding um, hardening. So that's the other security type of thing and they're adding features to do hardening and other bugs like that. Or oh, fix other things right. like that. As Linus said in the previous, you know, that you know, uh, we want the hackers to join us instead of attacking us. So how to kind of, you know, either encourage or incentivize people so that instead of kind of even if there are no such, you know, attacks or, you know, where pe we have seen people are exploiting it, how to encourage people to actually, you know, become part of, you know, the, the security community where they help the kernel community instead of... Uh, well, we always need help, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have, um, if you want to work on the kernel, you can usually get a job doing that. Mm -hmm. um, there, on the flip side, there's some companies that offer bounties for notifications of security bugs. Mm -hmm. I know Google does that. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of reports from Google where somebody's reported a bug to them. And then we look and see, and they think it's a security issue, we fix it or not. Um, so we get that a lot. So companies are willing to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So that um, there's other projects we have um, that, um, so Coverity is a static analysis tool. Um, for years, they've been running on the kernel, but nobody's been fixing all the bugs it finds. So the Common Infrastructure Initiative um, from Linux Foundation funded a kernel developer for a year to right. go through and just fix all those bugs. Mm -hmm. And he's doing an awesome job. And um, he's got a job for a year, right? So to do all this kind of stuff and, and work through and uh, fix all these bugs. Actually, I need to get him to do some of the Spectre fixes <laughs> to uh, think about it. Um, 
so yeah, so we have, uh, if you want a job to do this type of work, we have plenty of companies, any company would love to hire you. I know some people who have started off fixing bugs and then get hired by companies just mm -hmm. to do other development and things like that. Anything else you would like to talk about? I think about some, you know, I mean, I can talk to you for hours and yeah, hours. Yeah, sure. But we I have any other questions. But we have, you know. I don't have anything specific. So, yeah, uh, that's been consuming my life, is getting all the updates to all the backported kernels for that. But just, yeah, make sure you update your kernel. Um, take the update. Yeah, if you make a device, make sure it's always updatable. Right, right exactly, yeah. So there's some interesting things with... Um, Kernels are uh, wanting to be supported for a very long time because they're going into infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Like the um, Japan is putting them in streetlights. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're, you're about, yeah. <laughs> so that's a fun one. So making sure those kernels are stayed up to date and that we can test them properly in mm -hmm. order to be able to push them out safely. Uh, I've been working on that. Um, talking to lots of chip manufacturers that way. Uh, are you bored of this work? Or are you? Uh... It's always something different. It's always something different, right? And and um, I still do the normal development and and. Um, as far as review of the stuff that comes in, but no, mm -hmm. it's not for I haven't got bored yet. It changes all the time. There's always new hardware. There's always, new, I mean, one really, really neat thing about the, um, mm -hmm. the Google thing with um, Spectre and Heartbleed is it opened up a whole new um, research into these type of side channel attacks. That was mm -hmm. a brand new, it was a building on the prior art that the people have found, but it was, it was interesting in that it was, hey, there's something brand new here. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of fun. When I said, you know, you're bored, what I meant, but you have been doing this for so long. I have. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but the thing is that excitement is far from over. You know, the, the new use cases are coming out. IoT is coming, and so much is happening. You know, and everybody is using Linux for you know. Even Microsoft Azure is you know the there is yeah, Azure is ton of Linux. Uh, yeah, their 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 networking switches you know it, it runs on Linux, so a lot of more work. But if you look at the core kernel community, I mean, I'm going back to the question that people keep asking, it's still the same people, you know, you, Linus, and all those people. So how do you attract new people? Oh, come? we have new people all the time. So every kernel release, we have, what, 150 to 200 new people every three months? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a huge number, mm -hmm. right, of people. And we have, what, 2,500 people release? I don't remember the exact number. Uh -huh. Um, but so we have still have a huge number of new people every year, or mm -hmm. every release are attracted. And mm -hmm. um, there, there's a side thing. So is, when people ask, we're getting older, right? Mm -hmm. uh, new people. Um, is, it, is that a bad thing if people with experience and age are still working on a project because they still know what's going on? Mm -hmm. Or no, I think that's really good. I mean, look at the networking team. They've been doing networking for 20 years, right? That's a right. huge body of knowledge. So we want those people. That being said, we have new people coming in to show their ideas or we need the help. And we get new people in all the time. We have tons of work to do. Uh, we have tons of areas of the kernel that don't really have a maintainer. Um, and we still have, we st always need the help. So, and we're still attracting them, as long as we keep attracting new people. Uh, with all the security things coming up and the ex you know, explosion, you know, the how, the how much, like, what is your big concern when you look tomorrow that, oh, you're still worried, oh, that we should, you know, this is something we should be. What do I worry about? Uh -huh. Um, what am I worried about? I'm worried about legal stuff, unfortunately. What do you mean by that? Legal, so we've had the copyright troll problem recently. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, which the latest thing just happened today in Germany that the, um, the current person who was doing that um, withdrew his uh, appeal. Mm -hmm. So he gave up on this latest one, which was interesting. Um, I helped out actually with that defense a little bit. Um, and I put in, uh, it's not a friend of the court, I, I put in a little deposition saying, here's how Linux is developed, and things like that, questions about that. Because what, what he was proposing was not really the way Linux is developed. So there's legal threats that are, um, and trolls from outside our community are always my big threats, right? What is, um, what that can hurt us, and I always do joke, Linux is so successful and is everywhere, and so the only thing that can hurt Linux is Linux itself. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, you have said, said yeah. So what does make me worry is if we mess up, if we, if our development model crashes, if we do something stupid and we push people away, if we're not accepting still new developers, if we, our rate of change can go down, it's fine, our rate of change is so high, but if we're doing stupid things that we're um, driving people away from Linux because it's our fault, and mm -hmm. that's what I worry about. And so every year at the Kernel Summit, we reevaluate what we do, and we talk about our process. And one of the things was like, oh, we need to do licensing in a better way because lawyers are reviewing this stuff. This makes their life easier, and they can make sure they're compliant with our license easier. Great, here's a thing that can help right. them out. Um, new developers, we look at that all the time. 
Um, yeah, so as long as we're still doing things well, <laughs> that's what I've heard about. And, and the external legal threats. Right. I mean, this could be off record question. I would just ask based on your opinion. Then you said, you know, not to turn people away. And, you know, uh, sometime on mailing uh, list, you know, let us, you know, he has, you know, his own way of saying things. But what people, I'm not defending him or, you know, or, but what people forget is that. Uh, uh, that treatment is reserved only for the high level maintainer, you know, the top maintainer that he trusts, you know, fully, you know. So it's more like you're sitting in a boardroom with, let's say, Donald Trump, you know, and there are three advisors, top advisor, you know. So there the language can be any way it can be. So I don't really know how much you want to comment on it or not, but what I'm saying is that I see people misinterpreting because he, I mean, I've met him with the new people, he like very friendly, he explains things. Uh, so do you want to comment on that or not? So actually, I, this came up at lunch today with a group of people. Um, it's um, it's really hard to get Linus riled up. Mm -hmm. So in the kernel development, in the kernel community, we have one rule, and the one rule is we cannot break user space. Mm -hmm. We made that guarantee over a decade right. ago, called the Cambridge Rule because we happened to be in Cambridge at the time. Um, so Linus yells at you when you break that rule on purpose. If you break that rule accidentally, we're all human, we fix it, we move on, or we break it and we can't figure out how to fix it, we fix it and move on, or we do something. But Linus will yell at you when you're obstinate and you're saying, I'm breaking this and I'm okay with breaking this, and that's not okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, a high, it's a high bar to push him to yell at you. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. but some people are, I mean, Developers are not the most um, feedback-friendly people. Exactly. <laughs> um, that, that feedback loop is not always there, and email is a very tough medium in which to convey tone and expression of something, and sometimes you have to be very direct. But if you are trying to, if I do something stupid and I break something and I know I'm breaking something and I'm insisting I'm allowing it to break, Linus will yell at me, for rightfully so. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And it's always reported, you might say, because fights, I mean, Conflict is easy to report on, and people right. are reading about conflict. Exactly, it's more juice there. It's juicy, and yeah. like I always said, you should see emails for internal companies, right? Mm -hmm. I've been uh, developers; it's just totally separate. I've been in meetings at some companies where people cry, right? right? Some major companies used to have conflict as their major source of how they would resolve problems. Conflict was the right. way they resolved. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, that, and but so that's not a good thing at all. But um, I'm saying um, what we do, everything we do, is in the open. And our the, tens of thousands of emails we the are The big right. problem is that everything is in open, so your frustration is also in open. So sure, it's exactly. in the open. But and also, I mean, if I do something stupid or Mara does something stupid, we know each other. We right. drank exactly. beers. Exactly. And it's friends, so it's like, I also use the term, um, you don't put a live microphone on a Major League Baseball mm -hmm. or a exactly. major, league, major League Football ma um, manager because he's yelling at his yeah, players, yeah. right? It's professional. Oh, yes, I know I messed up. You're right because you told me that, and I can take that for the what it's meant to be. Um, yeah, but we're doing it in public. Right. And it's not the Little League. You don't yell at the Little League. Kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that way. Uh, since we do have some extra time, I wanted to, uh, because I talked to you earlier, but that was all not on the video format. Uh, <clears throat> how did you start your Linux journey? <laughs> I've told you this before. Yeah, but it um, was not on the... <laughs> that's fine. So um, I used Linux many, many years ago. I come from the embedded world. So mm -hmm. I used um, Linux in a product we um, made where we were using Sco. Linux they're running Oracle. Um, Oracle came out on Linux. Uh, we're like, let's try and install it, and it ran wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I'd used Linux for a while, and then um, I was working for a company um, that we made barcode scanners. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was trying to test out my device with USB on all sorts of different operating systems. Um, I accidentally made a barcode scanner that showed up as a 102 key mouse. Mm -hmm. So 102 key keyboard. Uh, Linux didn't like that. <laughs> and Linux didn't have a working USB stack at the time. So I, was, I saw this code and I was like, hey, I can contribute. And I fixed some bugs mm -hmm. and then it was fun. And then um, I've been messing around with it a while and then my wife I was going away taking our, our daughter to visit a friend and she said, hey, why don't, you write, why don't you play with Linux this weekend and write that driver you've been talking about. So I had this little weird USB to serial device. USB to serial converter, because I dealt with serial all the time. And I wrote a driver for it. And I submitted it. And I wrote it, and then um, I learned from the Linux Device Drivers book, which I ended up being a co-author on many years ago later. <laughs> um, I submitted it, and then instantly, I swear, within five minutes, somebody wrote back, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And you were happy. But I was happy. I was yeah. like, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, as, a, as somebody who is a programmer, I know I'm always going to have to keep learning, right? Mm -hmm. And as uh, you have to keep learning in order to get better. And constant state of change, you always have to keep learning and changing in order to adapt to the world. 
So I was like, yes, I didn't know about S&P, multiple processors, what's locking, and, and what's this? And oh yeah, I guess that is totally wrong. But that review process of, I always like to code reviews and, because you can get better. And so I didn't take it, and you have to learn how to get rid of your ego, and I can say I didn't have that ego, and criticizing my code was great. And I learned from that, and I did better, and I wrote that, and it was fun. And I had fun doing that, and I wrote drivers, and I wrote drivers for USB for a while, and then um, I realized more people use the stuff I gave away for free <laughs> than the, the company I worked for, because the company I worked for wasn't all that successful at the time. And then I got a job doing Linux, actually Linux security stuff. So mm -hmm. I started off in the security, security world. Oh, okay. And I helped write the first Linux um, security layer many years later. But a hot plug and stuff like that. So I've been involved in security for a long, long time. Yeah, okay. so. And how much influence do you have on your own kids? Are they all software developers? Or? <laughs> no. My daughter's, um, no, she has a degree in public health. Mm -hmm. And she wants to be a doctor, so she's applying to medical schools. Uh, my son, he knows how to program. We learned the basics. Um, he's now 13. But the interesting thing is um, <clears throat> you learn to, like, learn to code and um, code, uh, the code academy. You learn the basics and scratch and things like that. And then after you get past the basics, there's no... Nothing to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like, what do you, and the same thing with the kernel. You have these basic tasks, but there's no intermediate tasks. And finding a project on which somebody to work on is hard, because when there's Minecraft, you can build things and, and go away, and that's a good distraction, right? I didn't have Minecraft when I was learning how to program. Um, so there's so many other distractions that I, coming up with a solid program to make that hurdle to the intermediate stage is hard, and I haven't, I haven't figured out that problem. So he learned the basics, and that's good. And that's, everybody should learn the basics of programming just for whatever job you have. What do you have? What, what kind of hobbies do you have besides that kernel? <laughs> <laughs> I used to, um, when I lived in the US, I built a kayak, a wooden yeah, kayak. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, living in France, I don't have a wooden kayak <laughs> anymore, so I really don't have any hobbies. Cooking, I don't know. <laughs> travel, we travel a lot more and see different parts of Europe, it's fun. Right, and what was the reason why you moved to France? So I'd worked with the university mm -hmm. originally, um, and Ingria, they um, did that. I had gone over for a three month stay mm -hmm. and um, with the family, and we realized that, and we wanted to move anyway. And so we thought we'd try it a year, and because um, I can work anywhere, because exactly. it doesn't matter. And actually, it, being in Europe worked out really well, because I've done a lot of work with some German companies, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that, and going and visiting them is much easier right. than flying across the pond. Um, and I've gone to visit Arm in Cambridge, which is really easy. Mm -hmm. um, and then we stayed a year, and we renewed our visa. We want to stay longer. So, yeah, yeah when you mentioned the German company, uh, you had been the Suze and Tumbleweed yes. was one of the projects that you started, and now it has taken a totally different shape, where it's playing a very critical role in the whole Suze strategy. Yeah, I'm really happy to see that. Yeah, so, <laughs> what, so what do you think about it? I love. So I always I love that model, that that continually rolling update uh, model is a valid, I always thought was a valid model for what a lot of people needed. Because you see people, especially on doing the web stack, mm -hmm. and now containers are still that well, same model. Yes, you, yeah. you want to update that and you want to run the latest version of Ruby or latest version of PHP. And um, constantly update versus the old enterprise model where you backport things and you update on a yes. two year cycle and whatnot, um, which works for some environments. Yeah. And the old traditional Unix model and the old traditional Windows model was that way. I think the world changes faster mm -hmm. and you want to do different things, so I always like the rolling release. Right. Um, that's my opinion. Uh, I fully agree. I so, do rolling release, so I mean our bodies are rolling release, right? Yeah, we, and we also it's, it's a harder, I've seen companies upgrade from major Debian release this or to that, right. or, and it's all this this harshness all the time, mm -hmm. like, oh, I have to figure out all these changes that right. just happen, versus if I have a change a week, mm -hmm. I can roll with that. And I, I can I'm figure not, it out and, I, and move on and, and do it. Yeah, it's much easier, I, I think, to do that. And now with containers and Kubernetes and managing these things, um, it makes it much easier to push out updates and keep things more up to date in a fashion that way. I like that a lot better. And because I also use Arch Linux, and, but I prefer you know, Suze's uh, Tumbleweed because what uh, Richard Brown says that it's tested, you know, so that's kind of contrary to what uh, rolling release is because they... No, you can always do a rolling release and test it. Yeah, that's why yeah. he, he said, you know, it's a well-tested, you know, uh, rolling release versus, you know, whatever code is coming, just throwing out. So I, I love it. You know, yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's always like I say, you should always update your kernel to all your devices, but test it. Test it always yeah. test it. Yeah, because I test it and what we can test 
test things for, which are our tests are getting better and better and better. Lenaro is doing actually mm -hmm. an awesome job with testing stable releases on real hardware and putting a real load on them, right. not just build and boot. Exactly. So they're doing a great job with that. Um, so test for your environment, and because you're always going to use it in a different way. And then you can push it out. <laughs> yes. But test. test, so, test. Uh, and if you can't test, then you have a problem no matter what. If you, no if you, if you update this year or three years two later. Two years or five years later. Yeah. yeah, so you need to build your systems in a way that you can test. And mm -hmm. in the kernel, that's been an interesting thing. Is um, it, It's implicit that when we ever add new features, like new system calls, or whatnot, that we add tests mm -hmm. with it. Because we don't know if the feature you're adding is mm -hmm. right or not. Right. So and like some of these backports, when we're backporting these big security features backwards, um, I'm kind of like pushing back and say, how do you test this? And mm -hmm. they're like, well, we didn't test it, but it built. I'm like, okay, we need to actually test this to make sure that it did work right. and, and to validate that. So it's test and validate. Um, and so we're updating um, LTP, which is the old Linux test project. Mm -hmm. um, for years, was stagnant. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it had a bad reputation in that there's a lot of false positives in it. Mm -hmm. So it was always, is the test wrong or is the kernel wrong? And mm -hmm. most of the time, it was a test. Um, a lot of people are now finally, um, that's been revived, and they're, push, and they're pushing patches to it, um, and they're updating it for, fix all the false positives, and they're adding new features to it, so they're going to test more and more of Linux. And um, now it's running in Lenaro's testing, um, and it's really good. Google's doing some testing in that area. Um, so we want to test all these updates because the kernel does move very fast. Right. So we want to make sure we are at least not breaking anything. Right. So that's added to our test infrastructure. And um, the zero day bot from Intel tests every commit that we make to the kernel. And it's running all those tests on those as well. They have a huge list of tests that they run on every every tree and everything that before it even gets to Linus. And it has to pass those before it gets there. And testing is very, very good. Well, we were talking about Tumbleweed. What, do you, what, what are you running? Get Around Arch. Arch, you know, Arch? Oh, so you're a fellow Arch. You yes. know, I actually wrote an Arch tutorial. It's become so popular because you know, <laughs> people want to try it. And because once I went to Archway, it was just like hard for me to. Though my Plex server is always, almost always broken <laughs> because I use the uh, you know a, uh, Arch user repository R yes. or whatever you say it. And, but it's fun, you know. Yeah, Arch is good. I mean, the I resisted really hard. I don't want to be a developer of yet another distro. But yeah. Uh, it's nice just to be a consumer of a distro that is always up to date. Um, I have had problems where Arch updated its compiler and the kernel wasn't, I couldn't build things, so I had to make sure the kernel could do that. Mm. But that was fine. Yeah. Um, that was my fault. <laughs> because as a, as a journalist and as a user also, I like to stay on the you know, latest packages or whatever is there, so it helps me. I don't have to oh, wait yeah. for a distribution to, for two. I don't understand why they have to wait. When the project is open source, your distribution is open source, why can't you work in advance, you know, and you know, test and do everything at the early stages? Yeah, if you look the Debian release model, it's very, yeah. it's the old traditional re yes. software release model. And it began to work. So, one interesting thing about Spectra and um, Meltdown, I want mm -hmm. to say Heartbleed, um, was <laughs> that the original Intel approached the enterprise distros. Mm -hmm. And so, Red Hat and SUSE and Canonical were all notified before the community. Um, and the problem with that, and then the problem with that was the majority of the world does not run. Those kernels. Exactly. So the majority of the world, it turns out, runs Debian, mm -hmm. and it runs the, their own kernel yes. from kernel.org. Mm -hmm. So, the, like all the ho cloud hosting providers and all that stuff, like um, my cloud hosting provider runs just the kernel.org kernel, mm -hmm. and it's awesome. Um, so that was the big problem with um, Meltdown Spectre: is the one third of the world's kernels were safe, but the rest of the the community was not notified in time, so we couldn't get stuff out to the other people. So. One thing that um, education-wise is dealing with the old model of companies only dealing with other companies, um, that's not necessarily true. You have to talk to the community because the world runs on exactly. stockkernel.org <laughs> stuff or Debian. Actually, Debian is everywhere. Right. So that old model of the slow release for Debian does work. And they're really good at backporting stable stuff yes. or patches, and they go through a ton of work. I don't like it, because yes. so that, that model, but you can always run Debian bleeding edge. Um, but it does work for a huge, huge computing um, model, and mm -hmm. people are used to. So it's fine, and it's kept up to date. And it's very, the Debian guys do yes, wonderful yes. security mm -hmm. stuff. So everything they're doing is kept up to date, and it is rolling with the security fixes. <laughs> but when you upgrade to a bigger release, it's kind of then hard. because of that, yeah. Even and I have not updated my Linux server to the latest because I, I was worried that something will break. <laughs> because I'm running a couple of sites there with a lot of customization, so I, was, I didn't bother, you know, because it's still supported. So when it will be out of the end of cycle, <laughs> then I will update it. So I wish I ran Arch and Linux there. So, so I run Arch there. 
Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I mean because now I am like too busy with other things that I don't need time. I will like at one point, like if I was running Arsenal, I just open SSH, update it, and done. I don't have to worry about anything. So the, you know the cattle versus the pet model. Mm -hmm. So yes. I, I think you have the same problem. So my server instances are my pets because mm -hmm. they're carefully yes, tuned. Exactly, and yes. But if my laptop disappears today, I, I don't it's care. a pet and yes. I, or it's, it's cattle, and I can back it up from from my server. Everything is all in, nothing remains <laughs> here either. Way. Everything is backed up. Yeah, everything's more. secure, and yeah. if I lose, it's gone, it's fine. It breaks. I move on to the next one, and um, an hour my. Actually, less than an hour, my new laptop's up and running fine. Right. So, yeah, so it, I need to make that so my servers are treated that way. <laughs> and actually, yeah, Kubernetes and the way you handle containers, I've been starting to push some things to that, and it makes that much easier. Mm -hmm. So that model is much, much powerful. We, I have a te big build server for the my testing for Linux kernel, and it's now, I, it's, it's too, it, I'm overusing it. It's, so my builds are going slower because I'm doing so many builds, so I think I need to just split it out and start using the cloud more and make it. So, so what fun. kind of machine are you using? Can you give us know? I don't know. It's some big. It's in the. It's, it's in the data center we have. Okay. <laughs> so they bought me a big giant. I got a big giant Xeon build server. So do you go and sit inside just like science fiction movies? Sit in a big data. data no, center? no, no. So I, when I do <laughs> when I do a commit to the stable tree, mm -hmm. I have it, it, it commits and it pushes out and it fires off a test build mm -hmm. and I get a report from email um, depending on the load of it mm -hmm. within less than five minutes. But how secure is that server or data center? Who's it's just I'm building publicly available. Code. Oh, okay. I'm just building it. It's just a build. You know what I mean? And it's secure. Yeah. Uh, how about Linux machine? What kind of machine he uses? He also uses the same. Yes. I, I don't. That's just my test builds to make sure okay, I didn't break build, anything. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I've committed everything to a public tree anyway. Okay. So yes. it's like I, I run test builds that make sure that I, I didn't break the build, mm -hmm. didn't break any warnings, and um, things like that. That's all it is. It's just a test load. I just I could run it on. I need to run it on a zillion cloud instances and go faster. Um, yeah, so I run on my laptop mostly. So, but I, I don't have any s secrets, right? I got no secrets on my laptop. I don't know. Yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> it's just. I mean, when you're doing open, open, you're doing open, open source. source the, yeah. the patches, the changes that are coming to us are coming in public. Publicly, yeah. <laughs> so, no with the exception of the tiny, uh, the tiny subset of security patches, which only we only keep secret for a week anyway mm -hmm. before we push them out. So there's nothing. It's like secret there. My wife's always saying the Russians are going to get into your laptop. Yeah. Well, it's fine. It's, uh, it, <laughs> it's it like just James Bond movie, you know, aluminum case laptop with no, a chain I mean, on your hand. No, it's all secure it's by that. It's laptop. No, no. We, have, we have two factor authentication so that when Linus and I push to our public repos, mm -hmm. that, that is two factor authentication. So we do that. It's, um, so that's secure. We encrypt our laptop drives and things like that. So we have best practice. Actually, so Constantine, the system in for mm -hmm. kernel.org, has published a wonderful resource on how to um, do a secure Linux machine, Ooh. a developer machine, and given it all to kernel developers, it's public. Um, the system in guide for how to do a secure system in system, because all the, all the Linux Foundation system ins have to do this. And now he did a guide on how to do good GPG key handling. Okay. And how to how to rotate them properly and secure them properly and what the good methods of care and feeding of your GPG key because we use GPG for when we do releases we sign them push them out that way um, so he's been publicly making that available to everybody and that's a really good resource. What, what, was this back practice uh, uh, you know been adopted after that one thing happened where the LKML uh, Linux archive was kind of compromised? I think it happens. One so LKML.org is. Just a random website that mm -hmm. gets an email archive of the mm -hmm. kernel. So that has nothing to do with our development. Our mail server is fine. Mm -hmm. So that was just a, think of it as a copy of all our public email. It was just a mail server. So um, it's just a site you could search. So no, we I don't know, but there was something, I, I, because right now it's a long day, I've forgotten. There was something that was co compromised and you guys had to rebuild everything. Or Oh, when kernel.org yes, broke yes, down yes, many, yes. many years ago, yes. yes. Yeah, kernel.org got compromised many years ago. So what is be best practice about adopted up to that? Or? Oh, yeah, we have, oh, yeah, so we have redesigned how kernel.org works mm -hmm. amazingly. And he gave a talk on, um, a couple of years ago at the kernel recipes conference in France mm -hmm. on how kernel.org is designed and like, when Linus does a, I want to push a uh, release, here's the steps of how that. So it's all publicly documented of how mm -hmm. we do everything. And there used to be a Raspberry Pi involved in it too. Really? <laughs> yeah, the Raspberry Pi did some of the, the key signing because when we do the releases, it would, it would that because that was a secure little, air, almost air gap system. Um, I was told that the Raspberry Pi is not in use anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what, what replaced that, but it was something else. Uh, but there's the steps that are involved with our two factor authentication system and whatnot. And Constantine comes from the Fedora community. He was the system for the Fedora, and he's amazing. And the other kernel.org system are great. So they've built a system that is, we documented how mm -hmm. it all works, 
and it's really, really secure. And like he says, he wants to be able to make it if something happens to him or we need to pull, um, we need to revoke his access, we can do it like that. And it's still a secure system. Okay. So we, it's built and it's publicly, it's public, the design and implementation of all that is public as well. Mm -hmm. So other people can be, or use it for their secure mm -hmm. systems. Uh, anything else? I think we covered a lot of topics today. Yeah. It's fun talking to you. It's fun, yeah, I always fun talking to you uh, all it's the time. Good topics. Okay. Um, that was a wide range. It was, yeah. We, cover, we went from your, your own childhood days to your kids to friends to, yes, yeah, from kernel to security to Android. Yeah, we covered a lot. Thank you so much. It was, no yeah, nice to talk. It's always fun to talk to you. That's good.